Hey, what's going on guys? As a sysadmin or a programmer or any other type of IT person, your job is basically to either know a whole bunch of information or be able to find a bunch of information very quickly. Um, it's going to be sort of an integral part of learning how to be a sysadmin and getting these skills. Um, you're going to spend such a large percentage of your time either hunting for information or digesting it that if you make one of those things much faster and more efficient, um, then I think it's just going to be a much easier journey or more fun or less time wasted and less frustrating. So I'm going to cover the basic process you should sort of install in your brain on how to find information and when you have a problem that you're not sure how to approach, how sort of in, in what order to think about solving it and getting the information you need from the people or the documentation that you need. So what a lot of people do is they just simply start Googling and if you have a very specific error message or something uh, that can often lead to the quickest answer or fix, it, when you do that you really do want to make sure that you understand what you're doing when you, let's say, paste in whatever command um, is used to fix that. You want to know what the problem actually was, why that command fixes it, otherwise you're just copy and pasting stuff and you're a dummy. So don't be a dummy. However, a lot of the time, when you Google for something, you actually won't find the answer. Even if you Google well, the answer, especially with a lot of less mainstream software, is outdated or you know from seven years ago on a mailing list and you can't find the answer to the question. So um, I think the first document I would point to is on Cat B, Eric Raymond. Um, if you don't know the site, you should definitely check it out, catb.org. Um, you can see this has been updated since, uh, I thought it was older than 2004, but so at least 10 years now. Um, and it basically covers how to think about asking, what to make sure you have done before you ask, like make sure you've tried everything you can on your side. Now this isn't just good for, I mean, here it's presented as be respectful and figure out uh, you know, everything you can about the problem before you start asking people. There's nothing more annoying than a person who comes to a forum and says, ah, oh, I can't figure this out. Here's the error message. And when you ask the most basic questions like, uh, you know, what were you doing? Did you try this? Did you try calling it differently? Did you try changing permissions? What's in the log? They haven't even looked in all these basic areas that you absolutely need to look if you're trying to solve a problem. So basically, you want to make sure that you can prove that you're not one of those idiots who just comes in and sort of tries to suck time and energy from people who have other shit to do. And this is a really, really good document to read. It's kind of long, so treat it like a short story or something. Give it 20 minutes and read through. It will make you much better at asking questions, and it will really, really, really improve the answers that you get from people in different communities, whether that's software stuff or Unix and Linux. or I mean, this is just sort of etiquette for asking questions on the net. So... Obviously, it starts with things like ask in the right place, and it has some stuff on how to know what the right place is, and things uh, like I just saw, not cross-posting to different news groups. Now, a lot of you aren't getting help on news uh, on Usenet anymore, so some of these things apply less, but this is still, I, I checked through it because I, it's been probably five or six years since I looked at this, and it's been kept very up to date, so now there's like Stack Overflow on here, uh, which didn't exist that long ago. Um, obvious tips like writing in clear, grammatical, and correctly spelled language will get you much better results because it shows that you care and you're not just looking for the easy way. Uh, and then all the way to interpreting answers, um, what to do with the advice people give you, um, on and on if you can't get an answer, on and on. So you really, 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 really need to read this and you don't have an excuse because it's been translated into something like 20 languages. Okay. Speaking of the Stack Exchange sites, Server Fault is where you'll be spending probably quite a bit of time. Almost any question that you're going to run into in the first couple of years of being a sysadmin will have already been answered here. So you really don't want to be the guy just clicking ask question after or before searching. The Unix and Linux Stack Exchange, so that would be unix.stackexchange.com, same thing for Unix and Linux, so obviously if you're focused specifically on Linux problems, this cuts through all that Windows clutter on, ser um, on server fault. Uh, I was about to say super user. Super user is also another uh, Stack Exchange site, but it's more for like 
very small network questions or problems that you might have on, on a single PC. A lot of it's Windows based. Um, so it's, I think it's less interesting for professional system administrators, but it's there as well. So server faults, I would say is the main one for sysadmins. Unix and Linux Stack Exchange is excellent for specific questions about those platforms. Stack Overflow for any development related questions. I always include development stuff in my sysadmin tutorials because I really think you can't, you almost, almost, almost can't be uh, an effective sysadmin in the future without some levels, um, at least basic understanding of uh, not only scripting and automating things, uh, which is sort of the foundation of software development, but also how the software development process works when you blow it up a little bit and have like a development team doing it professionally. I think understanding that stuff is really, really important and will just make it much easier to communicate once you are working for a company that has a software team. And that's just almost just as important as having a technical foundation of skills. So you need to understand development and the best way to do that is to write a bunch of code yourself. And this is where you will come for help, Stack Overflow. Uh, from simple to complicated questions, there's everything pretty much covered here. The RFCs, from the horse's mouth, from the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the people or the group under this umbrella, all the RFCs are written. The RFCs are requests for comments, documents, uh, and they're basically protocol proposals, uh, proposals for the technology that runs the Internet, their standards. So, uh, you know, if you want to implement something, this is where you go to see what the standard is that everyone is using on the internet for something, whether that's mail, whether that's private addressing. Um, I like this interface a little bit better. This is faqs.org. They have an RFC thing and I already put in RFC 1918 here. So if you want to look at private addressing for private internets, for private networks, it's, you know, sort of an official sounding document, but if you can just get beyond the, uh, stiff language. This is probably the most efficient way to figure out how something works at a deep level. And I think one of the most important exercises any new system administrator can do is to read the RFCs for TCP and IP themselves and maybe UDP and uh, maybe how internet mail works. Uh, yeah, they're fairly, I mean, I printed these out when I was like 15 or 16 and that would have been like, you know, obviously one-sided printouts. I think I got it down to something like 50 pages, something like that. It's not, you know, it's not a semester's worth of work. This is the basic design document of this thing that we're working with every single day. You should have read it and you should understand at least most of how it works. It'll just make your life so much easier. Okay. Uh, man pages. I'm not doing this in a Linux machine right now, so I don't have access to man pages. But basically, you should, when you have a small problem, obviously, uh, like you don't know how to run a certain command, looking up the man page or the manual page for that command is the very, very, very first thing you should do. On Linux, these can sort of suck a lot of the time, um, especially because they'll document things that maybe aren't so interesting for people who are just trying to find out the syntax or you know, how to invoke the command. On the BSDs, the man pages tend to be a lot higher quality, um, and they'll usually include an example section at the bottom, which is really, really, really useful when all you're looking for is like, okay, give me like three examples of how people use this command and what specifically it does. That's often a much better way to grasp what a command does and how to use it than this like ultra nerdy like approach written by someone who understands what how the command is implemented and wants to like it just i find the linux man pages often to just be way lower quality in terms of you know maybe they sound impressive but they're they're less helpful i think than just seeing each option explained and then the examples at the bottom okay there i've said my piece i'm gonna get a whole bunch of angry emails now but uh there you go. So one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is they just type in man command. So by default, you're looking at the section eight uh, of the man pages, which is super user and sysadmin commands. So that's like the, the interface that's presented to you when you run it on a, in a shell. So on the command line, that's the equivalent to typing in man eight, the number eight, and then the command name. So you can see, uh, you know, whatever, uh, make a file system. So you would, if you typed in 
man make fs, that's what most people do. What you're actually doing is typing in man 8 for section 8, the sysadmin section, make fs by default. So if you're actually writing, let's say you're writing some C code and you want to use this uh, and call it with a system call, here is your delicious menu of system calls that you can use from your C code in Linux. Changing ownership of a file, let's say. Something very basic, right? So this is man2 chown, change owner. And here's just another interface. This is, I think, maybe less official, but it's the one that I started with. I think the one that I found first when I was a youngin. So uh, yet another explanation of the different sections of the man pages. Okay. So I'm not getting into mailing lists. I'm not getting into Usenet, but I think that with a search engine, with the how to ask questions article, like really read this, with having read, or at least knowing where to look for RFCs, the truth as it is implemented or as it should be implemented, which means if you reference an RFC, that's the defining document of the protocol or thing you're trying to look up. So definitely for networking related things, that's the place to go. There you go. Now you should know basically more or less what to read and where to go for help when you're wondering how to do something or how to approach something and at different levels of abstraction too, right? So like whether you're trying to look up how do I run this command or how does this protocol work, which is a very different question, or things like how would I best go about doing this complicated thing that requires, you know, three pieces of software and something else, this should give you a pretty clear idea of where to go for each of those different types of questions. Keep kicking ass and good luck on your sysadmin journey. See you in the next video.